All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex Perlman. I am a bioethicist and an independent journalist and researcher. And I'm so excited to be here today with my colleague, Christy Guarini, um, at the Biohacking Village at DEF CON. So thanks so much for having us. Um, Christy, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Christy. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy at Baylor College of Medicine and really happy to uh, be here, excited to share the results of the project that I've been working on with Alex. Yeah, we are so pumped to talk about this paper. And what we really were looking for um, was to ask whether oversight of ethics uh, was something that community scientists, biohackers are interested in. And if it turns out that that's the case, um, what forms any kind of oversight might take. Um, and so given that, you know, in these communities, there are a lot of different opinions, a lot of different um, backgrounds and ways that folks self-identify, we were really interested to see sort of what the attitudes were towards these questions. Um, and then we're really excited specifically to be able to come and then talk about our findings um, with this paper, especially because we um, are really adamant in the research that we do that it's for the communities that we're listening to. And that's really what we're doing. We're just interested in what the attitudes are and then reporting that data back to the community. Um, so I just wanted to kick off from the beginning. Christy, can you tell us a little bit about how this project came about? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, I'm currently a, a grant funded researcher uh, and my research does focus on this intersection of law, policy, ethics, and health. Um, I, I'm really interested in innovation in a past life. I was a patent attorney. Uh, and so when I came to Baylor, I did become aware of independent research communities uh, and the, the work that's being done in these spaces, became very interested uh, in that work. And so I uh, started investigating questions around ownership. Uh, during the conversations I was having about ownership questions, the, the broader, more general uh, questions around ethics and the role of ethics oversight in the communities kept coming up. Uh, so I went back to, to get uh, a little bit more grant funding to, to drill down into those issues in particular. And it seemed like the appropriate way to do so was through an interview study by uh, listening to and getting the perspectives of the individuals doing the work uh, whose work would be subjected to ethics oversight. Yeah, and I was so pleased and honored to be asked to join your research team as someone who had been reporting on and writing about these communities for so long. Um, and so one of the things we heard in our interviews, which definitely um, was something that I had encountered before, was a lot of different terms for self-identification. So we ultimately go with this umbrella term in the paper that's biomedical citizen scientists, but we also heard folks self-identify as biohackers, DIY biologists, citizen scientists, community scientists, um, independent scientists. And so, um, you know, we definitely had a diverse cross-section, a lot of these different sort of subgroups of independent research communities. But we also did a really deep dive into sort of who exactly were we interviewing and, and who were our um, study participants. So we have a slide. Sure, and I'm gonna share my screen. Yeah, so uh, Alex, thanks for, I mean, that I think that captures well that we were trying to elicit sort of uh, broad perspectives uh, that were um, sort of representative of various communities, multiple uh, communities and activities. We ended up, we did these interviews at two different conferences. Uh, the first was Biohack the Planet, and the second was the Global Community Bio Summit. Uh, we spoke to 35 individuals, and uh, the, this table, which I've broken down on the right, is reported in our larger paper uh, reporting our findings, which is published open access in Citizen Science Theory and Practice. So who are our interviewees? Uh, well, 60% did identify as male. Uh, the majority were between ages 30 and 50. 
Uh, they came from six different countries, uh, but the majority were based in the United States uh, and specifically in the United States uh, in the Northeast, uh, as well as the West Coast, really California. And then finally, our interviewees were pretty, pretty evenly split uh, between the two conferences uh, that they attended. Yeah, and we also, you know, were, were really interested um, in not only the practice of interviewing, that's one of my favorite things to do, um, but then also, you know, we get all of this interview data from these amazing folks who take the time to sit down with us. Um, and then what do we do with it, right? So we had this really um, wonderful um, qualitative research methodology that I thought was super interesting and very different from how journalists generally do research, even though a lot of times we get to the same place. So, you know, with an entire research team, which is about five or so people at the beginning of the pandemic, we went through a series of steps to sort of get to the heart of the data and the interviews. So what is it that we did, Christy? What was our qualitative research methods? Yeah, sure. Happy to, to summarize those steps. Um, and some of you listening in may be familiar with these steps, uh, but we really followed a pretty standard approach. Um, so first, we did have the audio recordings professionally transcribed. We then cleaned the transcripts. Uh, and by that, I mean that we uh, took the transcripts back to the audio to make sure that all of the words on the page were faithful to the audio recording, um, because every, every word is a, a data point, right? At that point, we then uh, turn to what's called coding, which is the activity that links data collection to data interpretation. Uh, so with coding, we uh, take the transcripts and we apply, we identify and apply codes to uh, different chunks of the transcripts. Um, the codes are really a way to identify patterns um, across the conversations, uh, because oftentimes interviewees will uh, talk for a long time. I mean, the conversation can veer away from the question where it began, right? So we need a way to sort of understand and organize uh, those conversations. Uh, so in a very long and iterative process, we dealt, develop a code book. Uh, as a team, we come together, we identify codes, we develop a preliminary code book, we take it back to the transcripts, um, we see if it works, it usually doesn't, it didn't in this case, we went back to the code book, we adjusted it, et cetera, until we had a final stable code book. Uh, at that point, we all went back to the transcripts and we coded all of the transcripts according to that final code book. Uh, we then generated coding reports and then sat down with the coding reports in order to uh, do the interpretation work and identify themes uh, that we knew we wanted to report in our final publication. Yep, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what those themes actually were. Um, and here I will share my screen. Um, we did, uh, we did find 10 sort of high level ethical priorities um, that folks noted as things that were important to them that they were thinking about and that they felt you know was really a part of conversations that were happening in the community and so those 10 that we sort of picked out of our of our data as the priorities of folks in these communities were autonomy respect diversity safety community consent, equality, education, altruism, and good science. And it seems, you know, kind of silly to say, because these are all pretty high level ethics concepts um, and principles that are necessary for good science, um, but they don't actually map exactly onto the traditional sort of establishment ethical principles that, um, you know, more traditional and establishment uh, ethical oversight um, models sort of use as guiding principles. And so that was a little bit interesting, but also it's really important to note that these conversations are already happening. When we went to talk to folks about what their attitudes were about ethics, it wasn't the first time that the, these conversations had come up and that it was, it was very clear that 
um, a lot of thought is going on in the community and a lot of conversations center around these concepts of ethical oversight and how do we do good science well um, and do it right. So that's one of the things that we um, definitely saw. Um, and I also wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the fact that there's already this culture of ethics that exists in, in, these, in these spaces, um, but there's not exactly a sort of centralized way that folks are using to actually put their principles into practice, right? Um, and so one of the things that we talk about in our paper are a few different models for ethical oversight that exist and that we have sort of um, seen examples of or, or know um, that folks might be interested in. And I'm happy to share uh, the conversations around those oversight models. I'm gonna yeah. share my screen uh, and I am watching the clock. So I'll, I'll try and do this in just a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, so as, as probably everybody here knows, the traditional uh, mechanism for ethics oversight in the United States is called the Institutional Review Board. Um, it is required for all uh, federally uh, funded research as well as FDA regulated uh, activities. Uh, so what we were interested in is what our interviewees' perspectives are on the feasibility and appropriateness of that model, as well as uh, some alternatives to it. Uh, given that IRBs may not be accessible to independent research communities, either because they're not affiliated with institutions or they can't afford the fees that are charged by independent IRBs. Uh, so so we, we set them out here. This is we call this our stair step figure um, where we've organized these models from uh, sort of formal processes to informal processes uh, uh, and external review, meaning external to uh, uh, the communities to uh, very internal uh, mechanisms. And with the caveat that we were not able to discuss every mechanism with every interviewee uh, due to time constraints. But if we start over on the left, um, we did discuss traditional IRB review as well as uh, uh, some sort of experimentation that's that's taking place with IRB review in some communities. So some communities are uh, registering their own IRBs. Uh, we discussed expert consultation models. This is where outside experts, uh, by that I mean professional ethicists, biosafety experts, other scientific experts, might make themselves available to communities uh, to provide opinions and answer questions. Then there's a community review model, which is uh, really a community-built uh, oversight committee. Uh, that usually, the, the idea is that they usually uh, provide guidance um, uh, to specific projects. Then there's this idea of crowdsource review, which is a, a really interesting model that's been proposed in the literature. And the idea is that an individual or individuals uh, designated as citizen ethicists uh, would provide their opinions on those projects. There's the idea of systematized self-reflection. Uh, this is a model that was used quite successfully by a group of quantified selfers. And the idea is that project participants get together periodically and they reflect on the ethical issues that they're confronting in their work. And then finally, all the way to the right are codes of ethics, which of course have been adopted uh, in community bio and DIY uh, uh, bio communities. Uh, so we, again, we, we sought to understand, you know, perspectives around feasibility and appropriateness uh, with these models. Yeah, and I think, you know, there was a wide range of opinions about and like attitudes about each one of these. And like you said, we didn't get a chance to bring up each one to every person, but we did ask a lot of people about a lot of different kinds of oversight models. Um, and so there's definitely, you know, the biggest split that I saw was, um, the difference in um, opinion about bringing on experts and even consulting with outside experts like, you know, folks who are legal experts or regulatory knowledgeable about regulatory schemes or bioethics or biosafety experts who are part of sort of establishment systems. Um, 
there was a large group of folks that we interviewed who are more hesitant about that. But then there are also those who are really, really open to that idea um, and are willing, that, are willing to engage in building bridges, building relationships, and having these sort of open conversations with folks in establishment spaces that I really am excited about. So um, I am too. A big takeaway for me is it needs to be the right partner. It needs to be a partner who is willing to invest time into understanding the activities and the priorities of the community that um, is asking them for help. I thought it was very encouraging though as well. Yeah. Um, so what, what are some of the barriers to getting to these models that you see? Yeah, so um, what we heard is, I mean, as you said, I mean, lots of interest in uh, trying out these different kinds of models, uh, but significant barriers in doing so. And honestly, it seems to come down to time and money, uh, especially if you look at sort of community review models, um, that, that really will take an investment uh, to, to establish, uh, as well as to sustain. So I think to me, that's that's the next big question is how we can support communities um, in it, you know, piloting these models um, uh, and helping them overcome those barriers. W what are your thoughts, though? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, our role is just to sort of listen and sort of help if, if we're asked. But that ultimately, you know, one of the other things that we heard sort of across the board, really, was that any kind of ethics oversight model needs to be culture built from inside the community and it needs to be driven by members of these communities um, and not from people who are outside. Um, and so that's that's basically what we were, you know, trying to do with this paper was just sort of listen and just sort of keep pushing this conversation along of, you know, that that had already been happening and will continue to happen. And um, you know, we're just really excited to to, you know, help continue to help and be there for for any advice or insight or whatever or more just more conversations at conferences because that's fun too mm -hmm. um, so yeah i think we're probably at the end of time but um I, we also wanted to note that um we we built a website called outlawbio.org and all of our research and a lot of christie's research and other members of our research team that is related um, can all be found on that website. Um, and so we're really excited to sort of share all of this with the community and, and build it out. Yeah, so thank you for the opportunity to, to share the project. Uh, it was great talking with you. Alex. Yeah, great to see you too, Christy. And thanks everyone at DEF CON for listening. And thank you especially to Nina and the other Biohacker Village um, organizers for having us. And um, yeah, hopefully we will see you next year in person. <laughs> One can only hope. Thank you so much, everyone.